everybody welcome. Wow. Great to be with you today. It really is. And I got to tell you, I am so excited about our time together because, believe it or not, we are now in week five of our six-week fall message series, Catalyst. Isn't that crazy? We're already in week five. And today I want to talk to you about how to be personally used by God. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever just kind of wondered like in your secret life, what is the purpose of my existence? I mean, why am I here? Have you ever just wondered where God is kind of touching down in your life and what he's doing and where he's leading you and what he wants to say to you? Have you ever just had one of those secret prayers Maybe nobody else even knows about it, where you just ask the question, God, what is it that you want from me? That is a very valid and honest question for one to ask. And what we're about to discover today is about how that it's not really so much about what God wants from you, it's really all about what God wants for you. And this is what God wants for every single one of us. And this is where he's taking us in this whole fall message series, Catalyst, is to expand our ability to trust him. That's what he wants to do because of this. Trust leads to dependency and dependency leads to closeness and relationship with God. Did you know that Abraham was known as a friend of God? Did you know that Jesus once said, I no longer call you servants, I call you my friends. Friendship with God, the nearness of God, being close to God, this is what he's doing in our hearts and our lives. Now, what would it look like for you to have this absolute perfect confidence in God without any reservations, without any hesitation or limitations to have this holy, heartfelt, capital T, trust in him. I want you just to imagine for a moment, uh, imagine with me that you're only like six years old. Now, for some of us, that's a stretch in our imagination because, well, it's been so long ago, right? Yeah. But just imagine you're like six years old, maybe just going on seven years old, and you're about to do something for the very first time in your life, something that you've never done before, and that is to jump off to the end of a diving board into the deep end of the swimming pool. Now, you've watched other people jump off the board. You've watched people dive off of the board. You've watched people do somersaults and backflips and belly busters off of the end of this diving board. But you yourself, you've never experienced that. It's a place you've never been before. So finally, you kind of get up the courage because of this driving desire within you that I'm just going to give this a try. So here you are. You're only like six, maybe seven years old. You climb the ladder. You get up on the board, and you take these very careful and calculated little steps until finally you get at the end of the diving board. And when you get there, it's kind of flexing, and it feels unstable, and it's awkward, and it's uncomfortable because it's a place you've never been before. And then you look down at the distance from the diving board to the deep end of the pool, and raw fear grips your heart. The fear of inadequacy. And then you panic. And then you look back at the ladder, and you entertain this thought about retreating. I'm just going to go back. I'm just going to call it a day. I'm not even going to attempt this. But then when you look up again... You look and you see your daddy like waist deep in the pool with a big warm smile on his face, his arms stretched out with his palms, his hands wide open, looking at you. And that's when you take that leap of faith. And oh my gosh, 
something you've never experienced before. I mean, it's so exhilarating, this like rush of adrenaline, such a thrill as you jump off of the end of that diving board into the water, you go down under the water and then up out of the water and you dog paddle to the side and you get out of the pool and then what do you do? The very first thing you do, you run back to the ladder, you climb it again and you spend the rest of the afternoon jumping off the end of the diving board over and over and over again because now you have this absolute perfect confidence that you can't go wrong, that your daddy's right there nearby. He's watching over you and somehow everything is going to be okay. Did you know that your faith is like a muscle and you flex your muscle, and it grows stronger. And the same is true when it comes to your faith. And this is why we experience so many of the setbacks, the challenges, the things we face in life that we're surprised by and we're taking back and we say, what in the world's going on? I can tell you what's going on as a follower of Jesus, what Jesus is doing in your life because he loves you so much. He's developing your faith. He's expanding your ability to trust him. Now, when talking to people about their faith journey and carefully listening, inevitably I hear people telling me over and over again as they describe their faith story, they say something like this. You know, I I, I just had this awakening. I said a big yes to Jesus. I was baptized. And then I just started kind of, you know, attending and hanging out. But I was kind of like a spectator. And sometimes I just felt like I was on the outside looking in. And but I was just kind of going through the motions and becoming like complacent. But then one day I saw a need. And when I saw that need, I decided to face down my fears of inadequacy and take that leap of faith, that step of faith, to take a risk to meet that need. And oh my gosh, the moment I did, man, God started blowing up and growing up my faith in a way that I never knew before. And I hear people telling me how they're in their experience through personal service, what a difference it made through serving on one of the teams here at the vineyard or maybe doing acts of kindness, reaching out to the people who tell me to their neighbors and just reaching out and helping out when help's needed and encouraging people that are discouraged and how that somehow that just seemed to awaken this part within them that was kind of dormant before. You know, the young lady that you saw on the stage up here, Grace Bloom, that was one of the female vocalists leading us in worship, Grace used to work at a local motorcycle shop, Cycle Outfitters, and I remember I would go in to buy parts, and I would see Grace, and I would give her an invitation to the vineyard. I would invite her to come for like Christmas or like Easter, and she was respectful, and she appreciated it, but she seemed a bit shy and a bit withdrawn, and she would turn down to the side and wouldn't even make eye contact to me. But over the years, I just kept inviting her to come. And then finally, one day, I look up, and here she is. She just shows up. What a pleasant surprise. And then the next thing I know, Grace says a big yes to Jesus. She's baptized, and then she faced down her fears of inadequacy, and she took that risk, that step of faith, to start singing with the Vineyard Band. And at first, she was a little withdrawn and, you know, was kind of getting a feel for it. And now she's flat out just going for it. And did you know that Grace actually leads worship every Sunday for Vineyard Kids? Isn't that great? Let's just give her a hand. That is awesome. And this is how it works in all of our lives when it comes to personal service, whether it's pointing somebody to Jesus, inviting someone, getting out of yourself and your comfort zone to take that step of faith, that risk to get involved in personal service in the life of another person. Would you take the outline out of your program entitled Personal Service? What we're about to see today is how God uses very ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things. And in doing this, what we do, 
we exchange our weakness for God's strength. Now, the account that we're about to look at is one of the greatest stories in the whole Bible. It's a true story. It's an event that really took place. And it's such a big deal, this one event that took place this one day, that it's actually recorded in the Bible by all four of the gospel writers, by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them give their perspective as eyewitnesses to this one event that we're about to see. And in this, what we're about to discover is what God was doing in the lives of the disciples is the exact same thing he's doing in your life and in my life today. In this, he was growing their faith. And in this, what we're about to discover, it isn't so much about what God wanted from them. It was all about what God wanted for them. And the same is true for you and me. So let me just give you the backstory, and then we're going to jump right into this. The backstory is that Jesus and the disciples, they're hanging out in Capernaum. That's home base for them at the northwest edge of the Sea of Galilee. And it's an early spring morning when they get this text message, this email, this phone call, or this personal message, or we don't really know for sure how it came, but a notification that somehow John the Baptist had been brutally executed. They actually took his head off, cut his head off. And this was such devastating news to Jesus and the disciples because John was not only Jesus' cousin, but he was also his childhood friend. And they were all close to John. And this was a terrible injustice, a terrible tragedy that had taken place by this power-hungry political government figure for the Roman government, Herod. And so they were devastated by this news, as only you can imagine, emotionally just wrecked over this. And that's when Jesus then looked at them and said, guys, we're going to go to a remote place for some rest and relaxation. We're going to pack your stuff up. Come on, we're going to take off. So they get in this boat, and they go only like seven miles away along the north edge of the Sea of Galilee to a nearby village. And when they get there, amazingly so, there's already a growing crowd of people on this grassy hillside already showing up, anticipating Jesus and his gang to show up because they had so many needs. And this is where we begin Jumping into the story, it's in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, and this is what we read. And Jesus saw, this is when they arrived there, Jesus saw the huge crowd as, they, as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach many things. Now when we read this same account from all four of the gospel writers, we discover that Jesus was not only teaching, he was not only preaching of the reality of the kingdom of God in the here and now, but he was demonstrating the kingdom of God in these miraculous signs and wonders in that he was healing their sick. He was giving sight to the blind. He was making it possible for people who were crippled to be able to walk. I mean, there was a phenomenon taking place here. It's like Jesus is just going wild and crazy over healing all these people and encouraging them and teaching them and demonstrating the kingdom of God. And all the while, the disciples are off on the sidelines as spectators watching Jesus do his thing. Can you imagine the confusion that must have been racing through their minds? They're already grieving over the loss of John. Jesus, what are you doing? This is a big event. All more and more people are showing up. I thought we were here for some R&R. &R. I thought we were here for some me time. And after all, how do I reconcile this in my mind that Jesus, you could do anything. I mean, you turn water into wine. You heal the sick. You give sight to the blind. You even raise the dead. And you're healing all these people. Why could you let this happen to John, beloved John, your cousin, your childhood friend. 
If you can do all of this, then why did that happen? Trying to reconcile this. And here's Jesus for not just 15 minutes, not just 45 minutes, for probably about eight to 10 hours. It was a long day. And we know this to be true because we read in verse 35, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. And it's already getting late. In other words, it's getting late. It's already in the early evening now. And they said to Jesus, send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. In other words, Jesus, just call it a day. We're weary. We're worn out. We're emotionally drained. We're physically tired. Why don't you just send these people away and let them fend for themselves? And then this is how Jesus responded in verse 37. But Jesus said, you feed them. Oh my gosh. The whole entire day, they're sitting on the sidelines. They're just spectators. They're observing Jesus do his thing. Now he's inviting them to get some skin in the game. He's confronting them with an impossible situation. He's saying, you feed them. Talk about the dread factor. But Jesus, there's not a a Wendy's, a Denny's. There's not even a Taco Bell or a McDonald's anywhere for miles. We're in a remote place. How in the world can we possibly feed these people? What are you thinking? They're confronted with something they've never done before. And they're scared to death as the dread factor sits in. The fear of inadequacy. This is what we read here. This is how they responded. Then Jesus said, you feed them. And they said, with what? They asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. What are they saying? They're saying it's an impossible situation. Friends, this is reality in our lives. Jesus is constantly inviting us into experiencing the supernatural, the miraculous things that are beyond our own limited abilities. And it's really all about the wow, but we get caught up in the how. How is this going to work? And we start dealing with all of these dark, dreadful doubts until, you know what we find ourselves doing? Backing up from the end of the diving board and to go down the ladder and just play it safe. When Jesus is inviting us, you can do it. Take that step. Just trust in me every step of the way. Now, in this account, we're about to see There's some incredible things take place, but most of all, more so than Jesus meeting the needs of these hungry people was what he was doing in the hearts and the lives of the disciples in expanding their capacity to trust and growing their faith. And this is how we discover how to be used by God the same four steps the disciples took on that day. Number one, first of all, is... You I write this down, bring what I have. This is where it all starts, to just bring what I have. You say, well, I don't have anything. Bring yourself. That's a great starting place. Just bring yourself. And then we read, Jesus said in Mark 6, 38, he said, how much bread do you have? He asked, go find out. They came back and reported We have five loaves of bread and two fish. And one of the other accounts, it reveals that it was Philip. That when Jesus said, well, go see what you have. See what you can come up with. See what there is there. And Philip came back and said, Jesus, this is what we could come up with. And then here's Andrew along with him and hands him these five mini barley bagels and two sardines. And this is it. This is what we have to do. This is what we have to bring. And and it's like Jesus asked them to just 
bring what you have and assess what you have and just bring it to me. This is the way it starts in all of our lives. We bring our personality, we bring our time, we bring our energy, we bring our money, we bring what skill we have, we, bring, we just bring it to Jesus. This is where it all starts. And notice Matthew gives us this insight that Jesus then said to them, bring them here to me. So they brought it to Jesus. Now John gives us another insight to what's taking place, that this is bigger than just what we see in the natural, the practical. And this is what John tells us in John 6, 6. He says, Jesus asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus is so intentional. He's so purposeful. He has this bigger overarching plan. It wasn't what he wanted from them. It was all about what he wanted for them. And they had to start somewhere to go from being spectators to becoming active participants to get some skin in the game and be part of what Jesus is doing. And this is going somewhere. So it all starts with bring it. Just bring it to Jesus. And then number two, number two is to do what I can. Just do what I can. Now, everybody can do something. And amazingly so, what I've observed throughout the years, the way really big, high impact things get done is not from some superstar, some hero, but a lot of people working together, an army of volunteers, and each of them is doing a little bit, and it's each of them doing a little bit collectively together creates this big wave, this huge impact. And by the way, there's something else we need to know and understand about this. Little as much as we're about to see when it's placed in the hands of the Lord. Never despise the days of small things. Think big and start small. Whenever you take what you have, you, Jesus said, those who are faithful in little things, he'll give them so much more. So just do what you can. Like bring it to Jesus and do what you can. And here's the deal. Even though it may seem so small to you, it's so significant in the economy of God's kingdom because of this, this is how we leave a legacy. The things that we do that seem so small, yet they're so big in the economy of God and so significant, listen to me, much of what you'll do in your personal service will far outlast your lifetime. That's huge. We read in Mark chapter 6, verse 39, then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit in groups on the green grass. So now just imagine this. Here they are. They're out on the side of this grassy hill. And as you're about to see in a moment, there's somewhere between 10 and 15,000 men, women, boys, and girls there. I mean, this is a massive crowd of people. They've been there all day long. The disciples say, send them away. Jesus says, you feed them. And then they bring what they have to Jesus and then, now he's asking them to do what they can do. He says, have them sit down in the green grass. And now, notice Luke gives us another insight in Luke 9, 14. He said, Jesus said, have them sit in groups of about 50 each. So here it's getting organized now. Here's a chaotic, massive crowd of people. And in this, we discover that God is a God of order. Did you know that God is a God of order? He's not a God of disorder, and he's not the author of confusion. If you don't believe God is a God of order, consider the solar system and how it works. Consider the complexity of the human body with all of its functioning systems that make us healthy. And consider the seasons and time and the peak of the colors in the fall, and the way the seasons come and change with consistency. God is a God of color, of complexity, and of order. So here they're doing what they can do. Now, I kind of imagine them on the side of that hill that day, even though they're emotionally drained, even though they're physically tired, now they're starting to like, 
They're, they're getting involved. They're participating. They're no longer on the sidelines. They're doing something. They're organizing these people. And I'm sure that Andrew is probably saying something like, you know, I'm really good at people skills. And one of the other ones says, well, I'm really good at organizing. And then Matthew says, well, I can count. I'm really good at counting. I'm a numbers guy. And they collaborate together. And you know what they do? They get all of these people all grouped up in 50s over the side of this grassy hill. And then once it's all set in place, Then we go for the next step. And this is a huge step. This is the high risk. Number three, trust Jesus to do what only he can do. So you bring what you have. You do what you can. And then just trust Jesus to do what only he can do. Isn't this reality in our lives in so many areas I mean, we know ourselves, we know our limitations, we know our abilities. Well, we can bring ourselves to Jesus, we can do what we can do, but then there comes a moment in time when we face situations in life that are so bigger and beyond us, an impossible situation that we don't know what to do. What, else, what, what can we do? I'll tell you what we can do. Trust Jesus to do what only he can do. And this is where it gets really exciting. In Mark chapter 6, verse 41, we read here, Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. Now, please don't miss this. Jesus, they brought what they could. And where did they get it from? We really don't know where they got the five loaves and the two fish other than there is this one insight where Andrew actually snatched or borrowed or asked for or ripped off a little boy's brown bag lunch. And and that's where he got it. You read all the accounts, okay? I I don't know that he ripped it off, but that's how he got it. So bring it to Jesus, do what you can do, and then trust Jesus to do what only he can do. But now, this is where the miraculous is about to take place because of this. Jesus takes what little bit this is. A little is a lot when it's in the hands of the master. Jesus holds it up to heaven, and he prays, and he blesses it. Then he starts breaking it up. Now, just imagine if you could just, the thrill of this, and the challenge of this, and the risk of this, to slip into the sandals of just one of the disciples in this moment. There are 12 wicker baskets. Jesus holds it up to heaven, blesses it, and breaks it. And you're one of the 12 disciples with one of those wicker baskets, and he takes the fragments of the broken bread and the dried up fish, and he starts placing it in the bottoms of each of these 12 baskets. And then you're to take these steps of faith, facing this hungry mog of people on the side of this hill, and you're carrying this wicker basket, and you're looking down in the bottom of it, and with every step that you take, everything's screaming out. I mean, it's loud. Not enough, not enough, not enough. And sheer dread grips your heart. The fear of inadequacy. But you choose to keep stepping, putting one foot in front of another, As you're looking into the face of these hungry group of 50 people gathered there in each of these groups, and when you get there, you take what little bit you have to work with that Jesus is blessed and broken, and you start giving it away. And in the activity, in the movement of giving it away, something supernatural happens. The more you give away, the more you have to give away, and you go from this sheer dread to now being perked up and going, oh my gosh, I'm being part of a miracle, and you keep giving it away until it's all gone, then you go back and you get some more in your basket, but you're no longer dragging your feet with dread. Now you're skipping and you're singing and you're asking people, would anybody like seconds? What a change. When Jesus puts a super 
on our natural and allows us to be part of a miracle. Friends, this is how to prepare for a miracle. Bring what you have. Do what you can. Trust Jesus to do what only he can do and see him put his super on your natural as you actively participate in personal service doing exactly what he's asked you to do and see the results and experience the miracle, which is number four. Number four is to experience the miracle. This is exactly what happened to them. And like us, they probably didn't even realize the magnitude of what was taking place until after it was over. And then they took a deep breath and they thought, oh my gosh, did this really happen? Were we part of feeding 10 to 15,000 hungry men, women, and children with no more than five little mini bagels and two sardines? Wow! This is what we read in Luke 9, 17, and this is how we know this was nothing short of a miracle. Everybody ate and was satisfied. Let's stop right there. Everybody ate, and notice, everybody was satisfied. Whenever you have any large group of people and everybody's satisfied, that is a miracle in and of itself. Everybody ate and was satisfied. And afterwards they collected with this 12 baskets fulls of pieces of bread and fish that were left over. They didn't waste anything. And in this, you know what we see revealed? In the generosity of God, in the greatness of God, in the goodness of God, not only is he a God of order, but he is a God of abundance. And he's generous And he is the God of more than enough. Not just enough to get by on. Not enough to just skim by. No, no, no. He's the God of more than enough. Twelve basketfuls left over. How do we know there was this many people there that day? Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. This is the last verse here. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men. Now notice that, 5,000 men besides women and children. Wherever there are 5,000 men, you're going to have at least 5,000 women and probably another 5,000 children. There could have been, I mean, between 10 and 15,000 people, a massive crowd of people. I mean, what a day that was. And how does this apply to our lives? Whenever you and I, we just come to Jesus, we just bring what we have. It starts with yourself. It starts with your heart. It starts with the attitude of your mind. It starts with your time, your energy, your money, your personal service. Just bring it to Jesus and just do, do what you can. Do something, do anything, but do something. Move from being on the sidelines to actively participating and getting in the game and see how you're going to start being awakened to the reality of your faith in ways that you never experience on the sidelines. It's kind of like the diving board. You never know until you jump off the board, the end of the board for your first time. You never know the exhilaration and the thrill and what that looks like and how you get unstuck from complacency by doing something with what you can do. And then, like for all of us, just trust Jesus to do what only he can do. And then in this, open your eyes, look around, discern what God's saying, what he's doing, discern the miracles that are taking place. You're part of the miracle here. Then your community church is a miracle. Lives are being touched and changed on a regular basis. And we get to participate and we get to be part of that. Would you please stand? Now I realize that on our spiritual journey that we're all at different places and for some of you here today, maybe the first step for you and the one thing for you to bring is just bring yourself to Jesus and say yes to him, maybe for the first time in your life 
to do business in your own heart with him, making peace with God by saying yes to Jesus and beginning a relationship with him. And then for those of you who've already said a big yes to Jesus, I can tell you your next step on your spiritual journey is to be baptized to be baptized. And next Sunday at both the 10 and the 1130, we're going to be celebrating changed lives through baptism. This is a great opportunity. This is an invitation slash opportunity for you to take that risk, even though it may be scary, and to just go for it and jump off the end of the board and just see what God will do in your life when you take that step of faith. And then for all of us, it's to Bring what, you, bring what you have in terms of your skill, your ability, your, your contribution to make a difference, and then just do something with what you have as we trust Jesus to do what only he can do. And collectively together, we experience the miracle of what God wants to do. We've only scratched the surface at Vineyard Community Church. The best is yet to come. God is taking us somewhere. And right now, what he's doing, he's expanding our capacity to trust. He's developing our faith. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are in charge. We thank you that when it comes to the impossible situations in life that are beyond our own limitations, our own abilities, that we can turn to you and that we can trust you. We thank you that you are for us and not against us. We thank you that you do have a purpose and a plan for our lives. Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you ignite our hearts? Would you open our eyes to see who you are and what you're doing? Would you give us ears to hear your still small voice, that whisper from heaven? Lord, would you light up right now that one thing, that one thing that you're, you're, Jesus is putting on your heart, a number of you, that one thing that he's asking you to do, whatever it may be. It could be giving somebody a word of encouragement, visiting someone. I, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, would you be willing to act in faith on that that he's given you and step out of your comfort zone and to just go for it. Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We say we love you, and we honor you, and we bless you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Hey, we have caring people that are coming up to the front and pray for you, and whatever you need you have, and just to let you know, next Sunday, not only is it Water Baptism Sunday, but we're also wrapping up our series Catalyst with the finale, where I'm going to be talking about power encounters and so, and how God uses power and counters to grow our faith. God bless you.